Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for, for coming today. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, appreciate, I appreciate that. Uh, listen, so it's my first day at the podium, and uh, I kind of figured that I might need some help. So I have asked Secretary Kerry to help uh, join me today, and so we have him remotely from Boston. Can we bring the Secretary up, please? There he is. Um, now, obviously, this is a live remote situation, so the secretary can't see you. I'm, uh, he's going to have a few comments to kick this off, uh, and then we're going to go to questions. The secretary also has a plane to catch, so we're not going to be able to take a lot of questions today. I will be moderating. I'll choose uh, those who we're going to uh, – I'll call on you. I'd ask you to just please, uh, as you ask your question, identify yourself and who you're with so the secretary knows who <coughs> Okay, Mr. Secretary, can you hear me okay? I sure can. John, thank you very, very much. And hello to everybody. Glad to see you. I'll be down in Washington later this afternoon and look forward to catching up to everybody. But uh, I, I really wanted to have a chance to personally welcome uh, former Admiral uh, John Kirby to the podium. Uh, it's a special privilege for the State Department to welcome him as our spokesperson. He's the face of the department now going forward. I've actually had a chance to watch him a number of times uh, from the hospital bed a few days ago, and I thought he just did an outstanding job uh, in his first days. So I'm really happy that he's going to be uh, taking over today officially at the podium and very, very much look forward to building a strong relationship with all of you. And John, thank you so much. Welcome aboard. We're really delighted to have you part of this team. Let me just say to uh, the members of the press there, and I very much look forward to getting back and picking up where we left off in our good give and take and back and forth, which I appreciate. <clears throat> but I wanted to uh, just share a couple of quick observations. Uh, I talked today with Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif uh, of Pakistan regarding a recent uh, increase in the tensions publicly between India and Pakistan. It's of uh, enormous concern to uh, all of us for all the obvious reasons. These are two very, very important countries playing a critical role with respect to regional interests. And uh, it's very, very important that there be no misinterpretation or uh, miscalculation with respect to uh, any of the back and forth and the empowerment some entities might feel as a result of that. Uh, the Prime Minister was extremely forthcoming. He could not have been more direct. He had actually just finished a conversation himself with the Prime Minister of India. Uh, and uh, we welcomed some thinking together about how we can work, all of us, uh, to try to reduce those tensions over the course of the next days and weeks. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, I'm going to be spending a fair amount of time in the next few days focused on China uh, for the security and economic dialogue, uh, which is coming, obviously, at a time of uh, some importance in terms of what has been going on uh, in the region, as well as uh, uh, conceivably some of the interests that we have with respect to trade, economy, and, and other interests. Uh, so it's going to be a very, very important meeting, uh, and I'm confident that we're going to have a full-throated discussion of all of the issues uh, that confront us. And that will be the prelude to my departing at some point. We're not exactly sure of the date, depending on how things move in Vienna over the course of the next days. But I will be leaving to uh, conduct uh, the uh, what one hopes would be the closeout and should be the closeout of the negotiations with respect to uh, the Iran nuclear program. Uh, obviously, the stakes on that are very high. Our position has not changed. I've noticed some back and forth in the last few days. Uh, but our positions uh, have not altered one iota from what we declared both in JPOA itself as well as in my own interviews and in our discussions with people over the course uh, of the last uh, few months. 
So the talks remain tough. Uh, they're critical. Uh, and just as I have said consistently, we're not going to rush to an agreement for the sake of an agreement, and we're not going to sign an agreement that we don't believe gets the job done. So with that said, uh, let me again welcome John to the podium, and uh, I'd be happy to share a couple of questions before I race out of here to jump on the plane. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. The uh, first question will come from Matt Lee. Hi, Mr. Secretary. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, welcome back almost, I guess. Good to see that you're back on your feet, kind of, so far. And uh, we'll <laughs> that's a nice boat, you, by, by the way, you have behind you. Looks quite intricate. Um, I, wanted to, <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to start I actually, with Iran. Uh, I actually uh, rebuilt part of that. The, the model or the, act, the original one? <laughs> I'm not old enough to build the original. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I want to start with Iran, if I could. Um, as you mentioned, there, are, there have been reports, and, and, and not just reports, but uh, officials' comments uh, from, from a variety of places over the course of the past couple days about the U.S. position in the, in the Iran negotiations. Um, you say that your position hasn't shifted one iota since the JPOA was signed, or even since. But is it not <coughs> is it not the case that this is a negotiation, and there will be and has to be, in fact, give and take between the two sides, between the the, the P five plus one and Iran? And if that is in fact the case, um, how can you say that you're not going to make any concessions? That there that there aren't going to be uh, and there, there isn't going to be any movement in, uh, in in your position, especially regarding uh, sanctions, the, what kind of sanctions get lifted, um, and and the the possible military dimensions, the re resolution of that. Thank you. Sure, Matt. Well, no, no, no listen. Um, of course, it's a negotiation, and of course, uh, there is always give and take in the context of a negotiation. But Lausanne defined fundamental parameters, as did the JPOA, of what needs to be achieved. For instance, uh, on something like pro you know, possible military dimensions, uh, the JPOA refers to that and says that it's got to be addressed in the context of the uh, uh, final uh, product. And that remains true. It has to be. And we have to resolve our questions about it with specificity. Uh, access is very, very critical. It's always been critical from day one. It remains critical. And we define that at Lausanne. And those are sort of fundamental outlines, if you will. Within that context, Matt, of course there's leeway uh, to be able to further define uh, certain things, and of course, there were things that I specifically articulated in Lausanne at the press conference, which we knew had not yet been resolved. So those things uh, remain obviously more open than others. But there are fundamental things here that uh, have to be adhered to in order to have the same definition of a good deal when we talked about it in Lausanne as when we talk about it now. And that has not changed, not going to change, can't change. Um, those are going to have to be uh, resolved along the lines that they were defined in Lausanne. Uh, Margaret? Mr. Secretary, it's uh, good to hear from you and to see you again. Um, it's Margaret Brennan from CBS. Uh, I have a question about Syria. How certain are you that it's the Assad regime that is carrying out these chlorine gas chemical attacks, and have you made any progress in getting them to stop? I am absolutely certain, we are certain, that the preponderance of those attacks have been carried out by the regime. And we're putting together a portfolio of that data that supports that, uh, even as we speak now. Uh, but that is not to say that some element of an opposition uh, may not have had access at one point in time or another and have actually utilized something at one point in time or another. But when I talk about the vast preponderance, I mean vast preponderance. Uh, it has been uh, significantly documented. It's dropped from airplanes. Uh, 
Uh, they're only, you know, the opposition isn't flying airplanes or helicopters. Uh, and you can go through a certain sort of tracking uh, of the delivery system and delivery approach. So it's frankly not that hard to pin down in the end. And that's some of what we will lay out at the appropriate time. Any progress in making them stop? Well, I discussed this with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov just yesterday, as a matter of fact. Uh, and I'm confident that he will raise it with them yet again. But uh, I think everybody's patience is wearing thin with respect to the extraordinary uh, uh, depravity of the weaponry and mechanisms for delivery which Assad has used against his own people. If you look at Aleppo, for instance, uh, ISIL is in the region, ISIL is in the area, ISIL is in fact attacking a community up there which could close off the movement of humanitarian assistance if they were to be successful and Assad has never tried to lay a finger on them. He's never attacked them. Instead he has dropped barrel bombs on civilians in Aleppo. And I raised that issue with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov yesterday and uh, that will increasingly be something that we'll be Focusing, focusing on more uh, publicly. But uh, needless to say, we are engaged in a number of efforts right now, uh, diplomatically and otherwise, to see whether or not there might be some life in the political track. Uh, and it's too early to answer that question. But we are not, we are not simply sitting there and allowing this to happen uh, without any efforts to see if there's a way to stop it. Thus far, it has not been stopped and uh, I think it is only increasing the international community's anger at uh, the Assad regime. Uh, Michael? Uh, sir, I'm Michael Gordon, New York Times. Uh, you mentioned that um, a possible military dimensions, which is the uh, term of art for suspected nuclear design work and testing of nuclear components, has to be addressed um, is part of a uh, prospective uh, Iran agreement. Um, do, do these concerns need to be fully resolved before sanctions are um, eased or, or released uh, or removed um, or suspended on Iran as part of that agreement? Is that a core principle or is that also negotiable? Thank you. Uh, Michael, uh, the possible military dimensions, uh, frankly, gets distorted a little bit uh, in some of the discussion in that uh, we're not fixated on Iran uh, specifically accounting for what they did at one point in time or another. We know what they did. We have no doubt. We have absolute knowledge with respect to the certain military activities they were engaged in. What we're concerned about is going forward. It's critical to us to know that going forward, those activities have been, uh, s uh, have been uh, stopped uh, and that we can account for that in a legitimate way. That clearly is one of the requirements in our judgment for what has to be achieved in order to have a legitimate agreement uh, and in order to have an agreement uh, to, to trigger any kind of material significant sanctions relief we would have to have those answers. Elise. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Elise Labick, good to see you. Um, you spoke about your Thank conversation you. with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. Could you talk about your discussions about Ukraine? It's, there are many reports that the Russians are moving heavy weaponry in, uh, across the border into Ukraine. There have been numerous violations of the Minsk Agreement. And there's been some talk that the U.S. is preparing additional sanctions along with the Europeans. It, it seems as if President Putin has uh, decided that he can absorb the costs of the current status quo. So how do you change um, and get the Russians to, to withdraw their troops, withdraw their support for the Russian-backed separatists, or are you planning additional punitive measures? Thank you. Well, thank you, Elise, <clears throat> and thanks for your uh, warm comments. I appreciate it. Uh, look, the... Uh, uh, we discussed this at some length yesterday, of course. Uh, and I made it very clear that 
the United States and European capacity to try to move forward with respect to sanctions relief is fully dependent on the implementation of the Minsk agreements. Now, there have been several meetings in the last days of the working groups and the trilateral group, which have been a little bit more productive than meetings heretofore, and a little bit of discipline has entered into the elections discussion with respect to the separatists. And I made it very clear to uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, and I think, you know, it wasn't, I, I really it was my emphasizing it because I think he uh, understands and accepts the idea that the working groups are the key to making Minsk happen. Now, the Russians always raise counter uh, initiatives by the Ukrainians, which they suggest uh, are causing the separatists to shell and to engage in further military activity. And frankly, <coughs> you just sort of get trapped in a rabbit's hole if you start discussing who did what, when, and how. Uh, and so we really tried to focus on how do we move from here forward. And I made it very, very clear. And he accepted the idea that there needs to be less fighting and more negotiating and more movement with respect to the Minsk implementation process. Uh, Toria Newland will be uh, over uh, visiting some folks in the region shortly, uh, in the, today, tomorrow, the next days. We are going to continue to be putting pressure on <clears throat> the process of the working groups to be able to more fully implement Minsk. And I made it, uh, you know, as clear as I possibly can that in the absence of a reduction in the hostilities and in the absence of further progress of the implementation, Europe and the United States are going to be united uh, in a rollover of the current level of sanctions, certainly. And whether or not more comes depends on what happens on the ground. Foreign Minister Lavrov indicated to me uh, that <clears throat> they want the Minsk implementation, uh, that they do believe that is the way to resolve this. But obviously, even as we've heard that before, we've also seen Russian activities that further support uh, the separatists in ways that are not productive. I called that to his attention, and we'll see whether or not in the next days uh, there can be progress made and whether or not uh, the uh, Minsk process actually takes greater hold through the working groups and the OSCE presence and oversight and ultimately through the uh, political pieces that need to be achieved on both sides in order to have uh, an election and begin to get the autonomy, the, the uh, individual autonomy steps in place uh, that have been at the heart of the separatist demands and of the uh, Ukrainian proffers with respect to a resolution. So if those things happen, there's a way forward. If they don't happen, if President Putin chooses to play a double game and uh, continues to allow the separatists to uh, press forward, then obviously we have a very uh, big challenge ahead of us. Okay, this will have to be the last uh, question, uh, Leslie. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, Leslie Roughton from Reuters. Um, I hope you're feeling better. Um, also you, coming, uh, remaining uh, uh, with uh, President Putin, um, today he said he would add more than 40 new intercontinental ballistic missiles um, in its nuclear arsenal this year. Does that concern you, or do you think it's saber-rattling, as, as NATO has indicated? Well, it does concern me. Of course it concerns me. We have the START agreement. We're trying to move in the opposite direction. We've had uh, enormous cooperation uh, from the 1990s forward with respect to the destruction of nuclear weapons that were in former territories of the Soviet Union. Uh, and nobody wants to see us step backwards. Nobody wants to, I think, uh, go back to a kind of Cold War status. It could well be uh, 
posturing with respect to negotiations because of their concerns about military moves being made by NATO itself, uh, the assurance program that's in place for the forward states, as well as potentially uh, the uh, missile defense uh, deployment uh, plan. So it's really hard to tell, but nobody should hear that kind of announcement from the leader of a powerful country and not be concerned about what the implications are. Okay, thanks everybody. We're gonna have to wrap it up there so that the secretary can catch his plane back to Washington. Sir, mm -hmm. thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, I mean, that's gonna conclude the press conference because I don't think I can improve upon that. Uh, so have a good day. Thank you. <laughs>